always feel like rejoicing. My mind doesn't always feel like saying, God, hey, I have a lot to praise. I have a lot to be thankful for. I mean, I don't automatically feel that way naturally. No one does 100% of the time because the body itself has different things going on or the mind or the stresses or the cares of this life can be bombarding your mind and you're not even thinking. But the beautiful thing about being a spirit who has a soul that lives in a body is that the spirit itself is not contained to the place where it can't give expression. It's a matter of our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, and this physical body that the spirit woman, spirit man, has to come through in order to have access. And so in that, we have been given the ability, though, to be able to say no to how my mind may be thinking at the time or my body may be feeling and say, I'm going to praise the Lord. I can say, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. Even though this situation may be going on in my life, even though circumstances may be negative that are opposing me, even though my body may feel a certain way, even though my mind may not feel like saying, God, I praise you, I can still choose to say, Lord, because your word says this is the day that you have made, I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. You know, as I was driving in this morning, I was thinking, and I was just listening to some worship songs and just praising God to get breakthrough, you know, my own way of feeling, my own mind, my own weariness, tiredness, whatever it may be. And before long, I just was in my car yelling, hallelujah, going down the, the 60 freeway. I don't care who's looking, but I'm like, hallelujah. Hallelujah! I mean, I'm expressive in my car, all the diesel trucks on one side and, and this time in the morning. But listening to those worship songs because they're alive, they're full of the word of God. Cause my body and my, my mind to begin to come in agreement with the words of God that were coming through those songs because to worship from my heart and I was saying, Lord, you know, you see the heart and the motive of every human being. You look at the heart where man looks at the outward appearance. And you know the motive behind every thought we think. You know the reason behind every word we speak, doesn't he? You know, that's what it says in the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter where it talks about, I'm sorry, the fourth chapter, verse 12, where it talks about the word of God and what the word of God is because the word of God is alive and it is living, amen? So I'm going to open up in prayer because I know that prayer is communicating with the Father, communicating through Jesus, communicating and just taking that time to say, Lord, I'm going to focus in on you right now. That's what prayer means at that point in time. So Lord, we thank you this morning. I thank you that this is the day that you have made and we get to choose to rejoice in it. And even those who, Lord God, you know that even in their bodies and their minds, they can't even conjure up the strength or the energy to want to say, thank you, Jesus, or praise you, Lord. But I thank you, Father God, that even through a whisper, you hear a whisper. Even through just that silence of, of just breaking through those lips to open up their mouths and be able to say, even though they may not feel like they have a reason to praise or look like there's a reason to praise, even though there's been so much negativity or pain or opposition going on in their lives, Father, I know because your word is alive and living and true and because you love them, you're right there with them, you're for them, you're on their side, you're wanting the best, you're wanting them well, you're wanting them whole, you're wanting them healed. You, Lord Jesus, who bore the crown of thorns on your head so that the breakthrough of oppression and depression and every form of mental illness and anguish that will bombard to steal, kill, and destroy and to literally take away our peace to try to remove the life and the light of who you are. I thank you for today that as your word comes forth, that it pierces the darkness because you and your word are one and your word is alive and living and powerful. 
So I thank you for those that are watching live stream and the ladies who are here present in the auditorium this morning. I thank you, Holy Ghost, that you're the spirit of truth and you're the one who leads and guides us into all truth, that you are our comforter, you are our helper, you are the redeemer, you are the one who takes what is of Jesus and reveals them to our hearts this morning. So I just thank you right now, Father God, for your shalom peace that your peace be imparted into every home that is present. I thank you for your glory because there's no time and no space in you. I thank you that you are everywhere, all the time, that you are all-knowing, all-powerful, always present because you are God Almighty. I just thank you, Lord God, that you loved us and love us so much that Jesus, your only begotten Son, you sent him to be the sacrifice for our sins. And he paid with his own body and his own blood the penalty for sin so that we could know you, so that we could have relationship with the only one true living God, our Heavenly Father. And I thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you thanks for your broken body, your poured out blood, your crushed body. We give you thanks for your pierced hands, your pierced, pierced feet and side and head from the crown of thorns. We give you thanks for being made sin with our sin, for taking our place and then counting and causing us and including us as one with you being crucified and dying your death and being buried with you in it and all of our sins being paid for and taken to the pit of hell. Hallelujah. And it was suffice. It was suffice. It was sufficient. You were the propitiation. Hallelujah. We say thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And that you were resurrected on the third day with all power and authority in your hand and raised up and seated at the right hand of the Father even now and given the name that is above every name in heaven, on earth and beneath the earth, whereby which men may be saved, but also, Lord God, the power and authority authority of the name of Jesus that you have delegated and given to your body in this earth to rule and reign. Hallelujah. That you are in us, with us, and for us. So I speak life to those who are holding on to where death is trying to grip you. Not just a physical death, but an emotional death. A death that is trying to plague your mind, plague your body, plague your finances, whatever kind of death that is trying to steal, kill, and destroy. I speak life. Jesus is life. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the way and the truth and the life. And if you are in Christ Jesus, there's a law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus that has set you free from the law of sin and death, that has given you the victory to live and not die. I, the victory to be the head and not the tail, to know that there is a source, there is a dynamic of the Spirit of God that is moving in and with and for you, even now because he loves you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? For it is Jesus that died. It is Jesus that justifies you. And it is your heavenly Father who loves you, who is with you and for you and on your side, even this very moment. So I speak life. I speak life. Live in the name of Jesus. Live. I speak life into your circumstances. I speak life in your home, in your body, in your mind. And I say, live in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Live in Jesus' name. You know, I thank you, Father, <laughs> that the blessing of the Lord make it rich, and with it there is no sorrow added to it. Because what you have blessed, no man can curse. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I thank you for that this morning. I thank you for the angels of God that are present here to see to it that your word is delivered and brought forth that it would bring life and change and healing and renewing of the mind and repentance and everything you send it to bring. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 What a mighty, mighty, mighty good God we serve.
He's a good God. He's a mighty God. He is a powerful God. He is a loving God. He is a kind God. He is a gentle God. He is a merciful God. He is a righteous God. He is a justice God. And he is an all-knowing, all-loving, all-giving, great, mighty God. Amen. I just love him. You know, I was saying to the Lord, I love you, Lord. I love you so much, Jesus. I love you, Holy Ghost. I love you, Daddy God. You are so good to us. You're so kind. You're so merciful. You know, if you ever want to know the character of God, all you have to do is read 1 Corinthians 13. Everything in that chapter. I can remember a time as a younger Christian all the more, and just many years before I began to have a revelation and gain understanding, and I'm still gaining revelation in that chapter. And I thought, how do I do all these things? This 1 Corinthians 13 is saying love is, love is kind, love is patient, love is gentle. It's like, how do I live in this when I know knowing myself and knowing my actions on a daily basis, how do I live up to this? Not knowing <laughs> that this was all something that was accessed through faith, that this was God's character. So I remember one time a lady by the name of Susie Alvarez did a teaching out of that scripture in our, one of our Bible studies several years ago. And she moved and put God's name there where it says love is, she put God is patient and kind. God is long-suffering. God does not get boiled over with jealousy. Because God's love, in Romans 5 it says, has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit of God. If you are a daughter or a son of the Most High God, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, the love of God, lives inside of you. What is in 1 Corinthians 13? Lives inside of you right now. Came with your new born again, new created spirit. All the attributes and nature and DNA of God Almighty. That love is poured into you. You know, we had a lady come a few years back, and she actually was the assistant to Corey Ten Boom in her latter years. And Corey Ten Boom lived here in California. And uh, this lady was her assistant, and also a lady by the name of Bernice, who used to attend our Tuesday morning Bible studies. She was actually her nurse, Corey Ten Boom's nurse, in her last years on this earth. And so Bernice came to Bible study here for a couple of years, and, and uh, she had given me several books of Corey Ten Boone's. I mean, Corey Ten Boone had one book called Tramp for the Lord, and I mean, just awesome. But I had the privilege to read in those books and just hear the heart of Corey Ten Boone. She had an evangelist heart. I mean, she never married, never had children. But some of you may be familiar with her story because her and her family were the ones that hid the Jews during the Holocaust. And then they had a setup of a person come in and set them up and found them out. And they arrested her, her sister, her father, brother, took them all all in, but they were God-fearing family. Her father was a clockmaker, and she was as well. But I remember in reading one of her books, her sister, who was in the concentration camp with her, who was the one who had a greater relationship with the Lord than even what Corey did at that time, you know, they abused her. There was a certain guard who just really abused her sister, where she watched him, you know, beat her sister. Her sister ended up dying in the concentrating camp, but her sister had a dream, and she told Corey about that dream. But Corey remembered the guard's face, never forgot the guard who tormented and was the reason behind her sister eventually dying. So when Corey gave her life to the Lord, you know, gave her life to the Lord and, and just, you would have to read, their, read her story of how God brought her out of that prison before the war even ended. But she went back, you know, her goal, her desire was to give God her everything and to be used of him. She called herself a tramp for the Lord. 
And so her desire was just to be completely surrendered, to be used by God however he wanted to use her life. But she had said one day she was going to go back, right, back into the very place that they had been taken to to take the gospel. So she ended up going back into Germany, ended up going back to that area where they were in that concentration camp. And she was speaking, you know, to that group of people, telling her testimony, telling her story about her family. And at the end, she was saying, you know, shaking people's hands and greeting them. This is what she said in her story. And the guard, her sister's name was Bessie, the guard who had abused her sister, who she had saw mistreat her sister, who was part of her sister's death, walked up to her, reached his hand out, and I believe if I'm, I may pronounce this wrong, but in their language, Ferlin, Ferlin, as German language that they call women, not by her name, but what they will call you as a female, I'm not pronouncing it right, but he reached his hand out and he said to her, Hi, I want to say to you, thank you so much for your word. I am a Christian now. And she said she looked in his face and the hate, because all, all that hate she had for him, because she never forgot his face. And here he was now standing before her, and he's a Christian. And he's coming to shake her hand. And she said she couldn't even move her hand out at first at all. And here he was standing with his hand extended to her. And all the hate that had been inside of her that she didn't even realize was still there because now she's face to face with one of the guards that was responsible for her sister's death. And she said, she said inside of herself, she said, God... There is no way I can love this man right now. But you, God, are love. And it's only through you that I can extend my hand to even shake this man's hand. And she says when she whispered that prayer to God, she felt something come down like from the top of her head, went into her shoulder, all through her arm, and her arm went extended to that man. And she said when she touched his hand and held his hand, not only did she shake his hand, but the love of God came all from within out over her that she embraced him. And she said at that moment, the love of God that was in her heart that was greater than the hate she had once felt for that man, that hate left her. There is no greater force or power than the love of God. The love of God was proven. God is most definitely a results God. He has evidence and results. His word never goes back to him empty-handed. The word of God says all of the promises are in Jesus Christ are yes and amen, so be it. All of the promises that are in Jesus Christ. You know, I love how I believe it's Isaiah 55. I could be mistaken, but I believe it's in Isaiah 55 or 58. I want to say 54 or 55. <laughs> but it says, as the rain comes down from heaven and as the snow comes down and waters the earth so that it brings forth, what? waters the seed to bring forth herb, to bring forth for man to eat. As it goes down, in essence, who's ever saw the snow drop and then go back up to the sky? No one. Who's ever saw rain come down and then decides, oh, we're going back up from the earth? You can't suck it back up out of the ground, right? And so it covers the whole earth. There you go. Thank you, Mary. For as the rain cometh down in the snow from heaven and returneth not there, King James says, thither, <laughs> but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower, bread to the eater. Next one, please. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth, 
God says, it shall not return unto me void, empty, without form, without working, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper, prosper, not poverty, not lack, prosper in the thing whereto I sent it for. God never has an empty word. God never speaks in vain. God never wastes his words. His words are always filled with purpose, on purpose for your lives. And this is the word of God right here, right? It always, but here's the other end of this. Me as the receiver, you as the receiver are the ones who get to choose to believe it and then act on it. Because there's nothing wrong with God's word. Everything he says about himself, everything he says his word is, everything he says his word will do, it's already happened. It's already been done. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. I can lie. You can lie. We can go back on our words, can't we? Have you ever had done, given promises and broken them? I have. Have you ever said something and not follow through? I have. Have you ever told a lie? I have. This is something good that, that if you can get this deep to register in your heart, in your unrenewed mind, God cannot lie. Mary, if you can find that verse, I believe it's over in uh, Hebrews. But God cannot lie. And so here he is speaking in Isaiah 55 saying every word, just like the rain, just like the snow that waters the earth so that it brings forth seed, right, to sow and bread to eat. So is my word that goes out. Here it is in Hebrews 6. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. It's not even possible for God to lie. That is good news. That is great news, especially where we live today. What's going on today? Where there's this battle, where right is trying to be wrong and good is going for bad, where we're living in a day and a time and a culture where the absolute truth is trying to be snuffed out, where God is trying to be removed and taken. I mean, it just literally not even exists. And here it says, which it was impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Wow. It is impossible for God to lie. That means it is not even possible for him to lie. You know, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. That goes along right with this verse. You know why it says that? Because God cannot lie. And his words and his word is settled forever. You know, it says over, I believe it's in the book of Psalms. I know it's in the book of Psalms. It says, you have exalted your word and your name, but you have exalted your word above your name. You know, another verse says, heaven and earth will pass away. But thy word, oh my goodness, his words, the word of God will continue forever. It says, this is mighty. You know, Jesus said in John 6, 63, for my words are spirit and they are life. Here's that verse, Numbers 23. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? We can trust in our God. We can trust in the word of God. It's only been in the past year for me personally that there became a settled, anchored within my own spirit, my own soul, that the word of God is God. God and his word are one. That it became like a revelation on the inside of me that this is God speaking. This is God. And I'm going to take his word as he is. I'm going to take God and his word as one. You know, that's a process. 
That's an unfolding of a process of a revelation that comes, you know, as we're spending that time thinking on his word, meditating, letting Holy Spirit just reveal him, revealing him in the relationship that we have with him. Not a religion, not a bunch of rules, not about I got to do this because this is right and I have to do this amount of times because if I don't, then I'm going to feel like I'm missing it. I'm going to feel like something's going to separate me from God. No, we're talking about relationship and in the process of relationship and spending time with people, spending time talking and listening and then being obedient to do what he's instructing. All of that understanding, all of that truth, it comes alive inside of you. You and the word becomes one. It's not a matter of I got to study so that I can know the right things to do and say. And all that's important. But truly, indeed, the number one purpose and reason for why we get into the word of God is to know him. The Bible is the only book, the only way in which you can know God, know Jesus, know who you are, know what he's done, know who you look like. This is the mirror. This is the mirror of the spirit. This this is the mirror of the identity of our relationship as sons and goddess of God. There is no other book. There is no other book. Thank God for Christian authors. Thank God for revelation. Thank God for the gifts that Jesus gave to the church. Yes, but there is no other book to substitute the word of God. Every Christian author is writing books because of revelation that Holy Ghost has given them to reveal in specific areas to help us. But there is no replacement. There is no substitute for the word of God. This is the only way I can know my identity. What Jesus, who he is, what he did, what his finished work is, what is working how he sees me. What does God say about me? What does God say about you? What belongs to you? You're heirs of God and joint heirs of Jesus. And the way we're able to understand that, if you're a parent and you know a parent wants to leave an inheritance for their children, right? Not just money, but that's a good thing if you left some money. <laughs> Unfortunately, my parents didn't have money. <laughs> but I didn't go, oh man, Bad parents didn't leave me any money. No. Because I have the God who created the whole universe. Mm. And many of you know, because you've had loved ones that have gone on, not one of them took anything from this earth with them. It all had to stay. Not one human being can die and take anything to heaven or to hell with them. It all stays here. You can put it on Mary. That's why the word says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, to gain your millions, gain your degrees, gain your power, gain all of your likes and not likes, gain all your Facebook followers, your thumbs up or thumbs down, whatever it may be, this lie, this facade, this deception, this false hope of identity that pumps up people to think that how many followers you have, how many likes you have, how many comments or no comments, who's wearing what, it is a fake, phony, false lie. And it is driving a generation to make them think that there's something that they're not and they wind up feeling empty and hopeless because it leads nowhere. I don't know where that came from because I'm not even a Facebooker. It says, and if children then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. See that word suffer? That doesn't mean sickness and disease. That's not the kind of suffer. He already took that. Do you know there's a scripture where Jesus was looking out over Jerusalem and he wept? Do you know Paul said, even if it was possible, he would give his own self just so his people, his Jews, could be saved and receive salvation? That's the kind of suffering. You have people in your life, they don't know Jesus. You have adult children or situations where people are not receiving Christ. We're suffering even now, aren't we? We have a sickness, a disease, we have a government, we have all this opposition, hatred, all these things going on. I don't know about you, but that makes me suffer. It makes me suffer in my soul. It makes me sad. 
It makes me feel like, number one, I know who's behind it. It's called the enemy. But number two, you see people making decisions and choices, fighting and strife and contention and all that. That makes me suffer. That's the suffering he's talking about, that we would suffer. Jesus suffered the rejection, went into his own hometown in Galilee, went there, Nazareth. And it says he could do no, nothing but a few miracles, a few healing because of their unbelief. Unbelief makes me suffer, right? Because when you know that can help somebody and you speak truth to them, you seek to give them guidance and they resist it, they refuse it, that makes me suffer. Because then I watch their lives being devastated. I watch people die. I watch people suffer. I watch people go without because of their unbelief, their rejection of the word, their rejection of Jesus. That makes me suffer. That grieves me. That hurts. Doesn't it hurt? I mean, once you get over being mad at them, doesn't it hurt? <laughs> once you want to kind of want them to suffer, doesn't it hurt? <laughs> We all go through those emotions and feelings. But more and more as you grow, it becomes less and less. Have you ever been in a situation and you've seen someone act a certain way? Arrogant, full of pride, hurting other people, just being mean, cruel, whatever. And then things, find, things start happening to them. You're going to go one or two ways. Usually the world go, good, they're, getting, they're reaping what they sow. They deserve that. You made your bed, now you lay in it. That was the term when I was growing up. You made your bed, now lay in it. That's really cruel, isn't it, when you think about it? Because guess what? I've not met one human being who hasn't made their own bed through some bad choice or decision. Every single one of us. That's why Jesus and the woman who was caught in adultery and the man that wasn't even brought there because it takes two to commit adultery, number one. But the man wasn't. She was dragged there. Man. God being who he is, kneels down, starts writing whatever he's writing. <laughs> Jesus was cool, <laughs> right? He would be the cool of cools, or he would be Michael Jackson's, I'm bad, I'm bad, right? But he just said very few words. Which one of you are without sin? You cast the first stone. How are they going to argue with that? And it says, each one began to walk away from the oldest to the youngest because none of them could say they had no sin. Wow. Just think about that a minute. It's no different today. Just think about that. What amazing grace. What mercy. What love. You know, I was thinking this morning, this thought came to me, someone who got cancer from smoking cigarettes. And they're hearing, that's your consequence. That's your reaping what you sold. Because you smoked, and they put the, the warning general thingy on the package. If you smoke, we know now, and I can remember the years of the fight of that before the FDA finally, Surgeon General finally put the warning on there. I don't know if there's warning on alcohol bottles, bottles because I'm not a drinker. I don't know if there's a warning on any alcohol or not. But then here's this person gets cancer of the lungs because they smoke. <laughs> which is a consequence, which is a reaping from what they've sowed, right? But do you know what God says to them? Come unto me. Come unto me. <laughs> Come on to me. I bore your sin. I took that sin. I bore that cancer. I lifted it in my own body. I took it. You know, I shared, um, I don't know where I was sharing, or I've shared this many times over the years, but, you know, I had my whole uh, time of, of God letting me, and he lets us all, I learned from King David that I could cry out to God all of my woes, all of my cares, all of what I'm feeling and thinking, and still acknowledge God, right? So I had been married, divorced two times. I had a miscarriage in 1986 in my fourth month of pregnancy, and I was in the midst of 
of that second marriage and he didn't want to be married to me and I was trying my best to take the word, believe the word, to make him stay married to me, make the word work, but there was no faith in it. There was no believing in it. It was out of fear, it was out of condemnation, and I didn't want to displease God. But I was walking in ignorance and lack of knowledge, and I felt guilty, condemned, and like a failure all at the same time, but I'm going to work the word. <laughs> I know the difference. I know the difference between making and trying to make the word work to fit out of religion, out of works, out of condemnation, out of fear, versus the word through faith. I know the difference. I've been there. I've lived through it many times. So I know that difference now at this point in my life of what it looks like to be on both sides of that. So I came to the Lord one day because, you know, you're thinking that God hears what you're thinking. He just wants you to know he's so in love with you. Thank you, Mary. I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. <laughs> You know, and God already knows what we're thinking. He's just waiting for you to come and tell him so you can get it off of you, get it out of you. He's not going to reject you. He's not going to be mad at you. He's not going to tell you, Shh, be quiet, I don't want to hear it. He's not going to do that. But he will be quiet and listen without interrupting you. <laughs> so I said, Jesus, I don't mean you any disrespect. God, I don't mean you any disrespect. I said, but Jesus, you were never married. You've never been divorced. You've never had a miscarriage. You know, I'm just telling them, because this was what I was really, I said, and I don't really know how you can really relate to me. <laughs> oh, there are people, I know you've been there. I know you're watching live stream, and there are people, you're there right now. Jesus, you never had COVID. Jesus, you've never been without a job. Jesus, you never had children. You never had anyone die and leave you, Jesus. How can you relate to me? You're a man. You never had a baby. He just wants you to tell him. He just wants you to know you can tell him everything you're thinking and feeling. He's going to listen. So I'm telling him all this. Because I really didn't mean any disrespect, but I, at that point in my life, I could not understand how could he relate to me. You know, because there was this saying that was, used to go around when I was younger, even in the church. People would say, oh, no, she can't minister to me if she's never been through what I've been through. Did any of you ever hear that? I need to know if you've ever been through it, then you can minister to me. But if you've never been through it, you can't tell me anything. I grew up hearing that, even in the church. I've even had people say, well, have you ever had this and that happen? And if I said no, they go, well, then you can't relate to what I'm going through. Think back. You've had that. Maybe you've even thought that. But that was, what, that was a belief inside of me that you, if you haven't experienced what I've experienced, then you really can't relate to me. Isn't that something going on right now? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> right? So like a good daddy, like a good savior, like a good Holy Ghost, they just let me talk. Then when I was done speaking, Mary, can you go to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, starting at verse 1, that chapter. This is what I begin to hear the Lord say to me, right? He told me, turn to Hebrew 12, right? Wherefore seeing we are also, or wherefore seeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which do it so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2, please. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, verse 3. For consider him, Jesus, <laughs> Margie, that endured such contradiction of sinners 
against himself. Least you, Margie, become weary and faint in your mind. Verse 4. You, Margie, have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you, Margie, is unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. Now God was not chastening me. To, to wasn't, didn't bring any of that. In essence, what he's saying, here's the word of God coming to show you the truth, to chasten you, to reveal to you what is of you and what is not of God, what is trying to overwhelm you and consume you. But I love, Mary, can you go back to, I believe it's verse three. If you can go back there. For consider Jesus, him that endured such contradiction of sinners. They cursed him. They rebuked him. They persecuted him. They hated him. Here's God was in the world and into his own creation, and they rejected him, called him a blasphemer. The, the, Pharisee, the Pharisees and Sadducees hated Jesus. They looked for so many ways to try to kill him. Read the Gospels. I mean, they wanted to throw him off a cliff. <laughs> Why? Because he was speaking the truth. He wronged no man, did he? Right? Contradictions of sinners against himself when least you be wearied and faint in your mind. I was weary and was fainting in my mind. Yes, everything I was saying to God was true. It was what had gone on in my life. But you know what God was saying, Margie? You're right. My son never was married. My son never was divorced. My son never had a miscarriage. He never lost any children. But my son went to the cross and my son was made sin. And my son never sinned. And my son didn't deserve anything that he went through. But he did it for you. He paid it all for you. So you're right. He never did what you went through. But he went beyond what you ever have to go through. And because of what he did for you, you will never taste eternal death. You will never face hell. You will never have to be without me. You will always have me. Mm. See, with his word, he chastens us. And then he rebukes. Because he wasn't saying, I don't care about how you feel and think. I know you went through all those things. They don't matter to me. God never said that, not once. If you go to Hebrews 4, mm, I love the word of God because it reveals the glory of God, the nature of God, the love of God, the goodness of God, because him and his word are one. Hebrews 4, Mary, down to the part, um, verse 12, and then we'll go down from there. I want to share this with you. God's word is alive and living. God's word is imparting life to you even now and if you receive it. For the word of God is quick. The Greek says it's alive and living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, meaning we are spirit, soul, and body. The Word of God is the thing that can show you what part is coming from our soul, man, what is of the spirit, and of the joints and marrow. That's part of the physical body. Do you know the joints and the marrow so deep? The marrow's in the bone. It's deep inside the bone. I mean, it's saying there's nothing hidden, nothing that can't be discovered or uncovered, nothing, nothing to the word of God is there. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents and motives of our heart. Verse 13, please. We're going to keep going down. Neither is there any creature, human being, animal, bird, fish in the ocean, nothing that is not manifest in his sight. He sees it all everything but all things are naked i mean he sees between underneath not in a sexual perverted way but in a way that there's nothing hidden there's nothing that god's not aware of in your life or see what's going on or in your body every pimple every lump every bump every every trump every slump hang whatever right it says but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do verse 14 Seeing then oh, that we have a great 
high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. That doesn't mean your job, your career. That means your confession, the words of your mouth, what you're saying. Let us hold fast our confession, verse 15. For we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, our aches, our pains, the suffering, the emotionals, the loss, the death, whatever you're feeling, whatever losses, whatever you're needing comfort, we have a high priest who cares. See, that's why it is shut me down. Why'd you shut up? Stop talking. You're not speaking faith. Don't tell me anymore. I know with my son, he's never been married. No, he listened because he's a great high priest. And he loves you. He's for you. He cares about everything that's on and going through you. He will never push you aside like man will. He will never tell you to shut up. He don't want to hear you. He will never do that. I may not have time to listen to you. Mandy may not have time to listen to you or anyone else. But God Almighty always has the time. Is always listening. Because we just read he sees everything. He hears everything. We just read that, right? And then it says... For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He feels it. He's a for real God. Jesus walked as a man on this earth with every form of emotions just like all of us. But was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly without fear without rejection, without condemnation, without the feeling of being put down, put away. You, ladies, gentlemen, live stream, watching, listening, the word of God says you come boldly, boldly. You know what it means to be bold about something. It means don't make any excuses. Don't listen to the accuser. Don't listen to the lies that try to keep you away from God. There is nothing separating you from God Almighty. Come boldly into the throne of grace. That is God's unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor. We serve at a throne of grace, not a throne of judgment, not a throne of condemnation, guilt, and shame. Why? That you and I may obtain. What does it mean to obtain something? It means to take it, take it, receive it. Mercy. Obtain mercy and find grace to help when? In your time of strength? No. In your time of abundance? No. In your time of pleasure? No. In your time of plenty? No. In your time of need. Oh my gosh. He knew <laughs> and he knows we have needs. Right? There are times when I quote in Corinthians, God, your word says that you will not allow me to be tempted above that which I am able to bear. But with that temptation will make a way of escape. Now, you have to see this word tempted and temptation. It's not just referring to sin. It's a temptation to take on sickness. Did you know that? When symptoms come to tempt your body, when the devil comes knocking at your door with a blood test, with an MRI, well, whatever diagnosis come knocking at your door, that is a temptation. Look it up. Look up the word tempted in the Greek and see what it means. When he comes knocking at the, there have no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able to bear. But, look at this, will with the temptation also make a way of escape, a way to escape it. Why? That you may be able to bear it. That means even in the presence of my enemies, my daddy has prepared a table before me. You know what that says? In this world, the hell itself is going to try to come against us, try to steal from us, try to kill us, try to destroy us. But God has prepared a table and a way of escape. Even in the process and in the midst of the temptation, he's made a way of escape where we will be able to bear it. Doesn't mean you're taken, removed out of it. Doesn't mean, what did Jesus do with the three Hebrew boys? They threw them in the fire. They did not, not get thrown in the fire, but he showed up in the fire. Woo! Glory be to God. 
He showed up in the fire. He was the fourth man in the fire. Don't tell me God could have kept him from being thrown in there. But God is a great, mighty God, and the devil ain't got nothing on him, and neither does man. God said, you want to see something? Turn that furnace up and watch me come in there. Mm. Is it getting too hot? You feel like you're in a fiery furnace? Well, the man, God Almighty, he's in there with you. And if you'll keep your faith and trust in him, he will make a way to escape that you will be able to bear it. Daniel was in the lion's den, and God caused the lion's mouth to be shut. Don't tell me the same God with them. He's the same God with me. Mm, Jesus Christ the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. I want you to think about something. Those three Hebrew men, Daniel himself, they didn't even have Jesus living in them. Think about this. But they believed their God. They didn't even have a brand new spirit yet. They weren't even born of God. <laughs> but they were the covenant children. They were the covenant people. We are now the covenant people right along with them. We have received the blessing of Abraham, the promise of Abraham, because we, Jesus, was the seed that was promised to Abraham, and we have come through through Jesus. It's through Jesus. Now God, the kingdom of God, lives inside of you and me, and now Jesus tells us, you shut the mouths of lions. You raise the dead. You heal the sick. You cast out devils. You cleanse the lepers. Hey, he has taken from being on the outside that now he's on the inside with his glory and his power in the temple of our body. Glory be to God. Woo, hallelujah. <laughs> and if they could remain faithful and true to their God with their God only being on the outside, how much more us with our God living on the inside? Woo, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I know I may be a little bit fanatic and passion and zealing and over the top this morning. But I am telling you, there is a devil who's trying to shut up the mouths of Christians, trying to, trying to harass trying to push us down, trying to snuff the truth out. And I am telling you, there's a lion roaring, Mandy. There's a lion roaring. And he is roaring in us and through us. And I refuse to be silent. I will speak the truth of the word of God, even if they say we're going to put you in jail. Come on. There was a time in my immaturity as a younger Christian, and I was mouthing off, Jesus, I'll die for you. If they put a gun to my head, I'll die for you. I think it was something about the tribulation and being there watching those movies and those who were at the end that, that if they didn't take the mark of the beast and would they be willing to die? It was some movie I watched. This was during that time when I was like, oh, yeah, Jesus, that won't be me. I'll say, no, I'm not taking the mark. <laughs> there again, here's God in his goodness. The next day I hear the Lord say this to me, Margie. Will you die for me? Now it's just me and God, right? I know he knows me. I know he knows when I'm lying and when I'm telling the truth. You know that, right? If you didn't know that, you need to know that. <laughs> he already knows. We just read it. He knows the intents and purposes of our hearts. He knows every thought. He said, Margie, will you really die for me? And at that point in time in my life, I said, God, I would hope I would want to, but I'm not sure. I couldn't say with confidence at that point in my life because I'm like, I don't know. I'm scared. I don't know. <laughs> but today, many years later, because I'm not afraid of death, death died to Jesus. And if it's for the sake of the gospel, I don't care. I already know. I already know where I'm going. I already know who I am. I already know I'm loved. And today, I can truly say from my heart, yes, Lord. And he knows it. So to take persecution, because I'm going to tell you something, women of God, men of God. We're not going backwards. 
and more persecution is going to come. It's been happening in other countries. We just have been so blessed in America. But because the word and the heat and the glory of God is being turned up, more and more the dullness, the blindness, the deception that has gone even on in the church, where there's come the compromise of the word, where people were no longer in the word, and they're finding themselves like, wait a minute, what do I believe? What do we believe? Uh, wait a minute, do we go on the bandwagon with the media or do we stay with the word of God? Many people are finding themselves, and I can say this because I talk to a lot of people. There are people believing things you would be amazed. You would be amazed that has literally left me in tears. Because I'm thinking, you know how you hear something and you think, wait a minute, is that, is that, did I just hear that? With such conviction? And it's like you know what the word of God says. You, you, you know what it says. But you're talking to another Christian and they're literally saying to you, oh no, this is what God said. And it does not match up with the word at all. Oh, sisters, brothers, please get into the word. Let the word get into you. Because there is a deception that is pulling and luring the flesh and emotions and that is luring, and it sounds good, and it's a mixture. And it's to shut down and water down and snap out and get out the truth of what God's word says. And I'm at a place now, and I thank God more and more that he's going to help me to keep growing there. I'm staying in the school of the Holy Ghost, but to keep growing there. I don't ever seek to respond or react towards anyone with condemnation or with a put down. There is no one beneath me. There is no one above me. I know from whence I've come, and I know whose I am, and it's Jesus. Margie died, and my life is hidden in Jesus with God Almighty. He ransomed me. He bought me. I am his slave. I am his ransom. I am whatever he wants and needs me to be. I died. Colossians says, we died. Paul said, we died. And our lives are hidden in Jesus with God. Right? But there's some stuff going on. That, that the word said, Peter, it said what was going to take place in the last days. Do I think the vaccine is the mark of the beast? No, it is not. Is there a precursor going on? You better believe it. Is there lines being drawn to help you to see and I see what do we really believe or don't believe or which way are we going to go or not going to go or however? You better believe it. Is there an enemy trying to bring division in the body of Christ? You better believe it. And if not for that reason alone, we got to get in the word of God so that we don't let the devil divide the body of Christ. Because a kingdom divided, it cannot stand. And there's only one body of Christ. There's only one body of Christ. And we're to do whatever we can for the love of God and the love for one another to keep the devil out of it. Mm. Years ago, the kids used to sing, that old devil, he's a sly old fox. <laughs> and it's true of his nature. He is a sly old fox. He is subtle, and he is a deceiver. And he is not after the world. He is after Christians. And he knows the difference between Christians who know their authority and those who don't. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more. For whatsoever is more than these things cometh of evil. That means know where you stand. Know where your father stands. Know where your savior stands. Talk to other believers. Man, there are Christians literally thinking that they don't even have to go before <laughs> uh, uh, justice of the peace or a minister to even get married. They say, God says we're married. Since God says we're married, we're married. You think I'm joking? I am not joking. And all I can say is, but what does the word of God say about that? Because God's not going to tell you something 
that is not in his word. I don't care what the prophet's name is. I don't care how they're dressed. If whatever is being said is not in line with God's word, it is not God. You have the Holy Spirit in you to bear witness to what is true. But when I want what I want, because I've been there, when I want what I want, I can make anything true to be what I want it to be. Oh, yeah, I've had many opportunities, and I've given in to them. I know the difference. I can want something. I wanted something so bad. I, hey, how many of you know I don't have a son except for my son in love, Keegan? When I was pregnant with Faith, I just knew I was having a son. God told me I'm having a son. Those who knew me then, Margie, what you having? God told me I'm having a son. Yeah, yeah. Because I felt like a failure as a mother to a daughter. Because I had such opposition with my oldest daughter. And I just knew it was my fault. Because I wasn't a good enough mother. I took all the blame for all of her actions. Because I wasn't a good enough mother. I didn't do it right enough. I was wrong. I yelled. I said wrong things to her. I made her the way she is. Therefore, God, we're not having no daughter. We're having a son. Up until I was seven months pregnant. Up until I was seven months pregnant, we had no girl names. We just knew we are having a boy. Had an ultrasound in seven months, a girl. I went, a girl? And my doctor goes, is that okay? <laughs> hey, it's going to be okay, right? I said, ooh, wait till I tell Robert. Because <laughs> that's how much we just knew we were having a boy. Because you weren't going to tell me differently. Do you know you can get so dogmatic on believing something is from God because that's what you want so badly that you won't even listen to other people? And at that point in time, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's what that means. When I'm not humbling myself, when I'm not saying it's your will, Lord, it's what you want, it's what you're saying. In essence, I'm shutting myself off. I'm putting up that wall from hearing. It's not God not speaking to me. I had a girlfriend, she goes, I knew you were having a girl, but I wasn't going to say anything to you. <laughs> you were so gung-ho about God said you having a boy. Will you give people permission to speak to your life who you trust? Will you give people permission to speak to your life who you trust? Who you've seen their fruits, you've seen their results. Is there someone in your life that you've given permission that they can tell you truth even when you may not want to hear it because they love you and don't want you to have a car wreck or a train wreck or devastation or destruction in your life. Is there someone you're willing to get permission to speak that truth to you? Because if not, I ask you to find somebody because it's only out of love. Because sometimes I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I don't care what your age is today. We still can get deceived and mixed up when it comes to things we want so badly are so desperately, especially in that line when it comes to one husband's, <laughs> man, that compromise can be great. I mean, the devil comes and our mind goes, well, he can grow with me in the Lord. It's okay. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> it's okay. I may not get another person. I mean, after all, I've waited this long and I'm this age. No, I'm going to take what comes, girl. <laughs> We're going to snatch him up. Are we going to snatch her up? If you've waited that long, think about this. If you waited that long and you've been in peace, although you've been desiring that spouse, why would you be willing to compromise the rest of your life with hell? You're so much more worthier than that than Jesus. Just think about it. Find someone you trust that you know they can speak truth to you even when your mind is going wacky <laughs> because of your emotions. I don't know of one human being that doesn't deal with that at times, whether it's finances, whatever it is. God loves you, right? He loves you. He cares about you. You're his daughter. He's so in love with you. My prayer is more and more that you get a revelation of how much God is in love with you. I'm not talking about in love like the world's way of in love. I'm talking about it in love that he was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son love 
and loves you and I the same way he loves his son. Not based on how you look, the color of your skin, the size of your body, your hair, anything, but based on the blood of his son. Mm, Because they created us. We're their creation. Wow. I'm going to close with this for live stream, but I believe one of the saddest days that is still yet to come for God and Jesus is the day of judgment. When God's going to have to say to many of his own creation, you got to go. You got to go. You can't stay here. You can't be here. You can't because you didn't choose when you were alive on earth. You didn't choose my son. I don't know about you, but that's one of those things that drives me all the more to say, do you know Jesus? Have you made him your Lord? Not to tell him because you're going to go to hell, but to tell him there's a God who loves you so much that he gave his life for you and he wants you to live with him forever because after you leave this earth, you're going to continue to live forever. You are an eternal spirit and there's a God who created you who he doesn't want to live without you. He doesn't want to live without you, but he needs your permission. He needs you to choose him. Mm. Compassion, God. Compassion. Compassion, Jesus. Let your compassion, let your compassion flood us today. Let your compassion rise up, overtake us, baptize us with your compassion, Lord, for those who don't know you. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for those watching live stream. I pray that this word that the Spirit of God has brought is moving in your heart, revealing it to you, that it is bringing life to you, it is bringing God's love to you, it is causing you to make decisions. The Holy Spirit of God moving, revealing, and bringing that life. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want you to know he died for you. He bore your sins. And he was buried in a tomb. He went to hell and he took the penalty and paid the price. But he was raised from the dead on the third day with all power and authority to make the way possible that every human being could come and know our creator, our father. And all it requires is you believing that he did pay for your sins, that he is the son of God, that he died on that cross. He was buried in a tomb and he was raised from the dead on the third day, making the way possible that we would be made right with God. But here's the thing. He already did it over 2,000 years ago. He already provided it for you. He's just been waiting for you to choose. And this day, I encourage you to choose life. Choose Jesus. And the way you just do that, the word of God says you believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth. You say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died for my sins. And I believe you died and you were buried in the tomb. And I believe you were raised from the dead for me. And I believe that, Lord Jesus. And I ask you to come into my heart right now. I ask you to come and be my savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for taking my sins away. I choose you, Jesus. And I ask you to come and be my savior now in the name of Jesus. You're saved. If you put your faith in him, simple prayer. It changed your life. You become a brand new creation. You become a son and a daughter of God. And you're his. And I'll leave you with that today. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next Tuesday.